wanted to be bad. We reached a point where the masks came off, and we no longer felt the need to cover up who we really are. It was as if the act of pretending was too much effort to maintain. This is when honesty becomes the norm, and life's realities truly begin. So, if you've gained a bit of weight, embrace it. If you prefer a day doing nothing, invest in a comfortable sofa. Struggle with reading the fine print. Opt for a larger TV and forget about the hassle of contacts. There's no longer a need to hide your flaws from your partner because, after all this time, you're in it together, for better or worse. And it's not just a one-way street. Women, too, reach a point where comfort trumps allure. The days of uncomfortable undergarments and towering heels give way to the relief of practicality, with a silent challenge to their partners to dare comment. Let the good times roll, indeed. As for me, I'm 54. Thanks to some savvy investments and a bit of luck in my career as an engineer, I've retired early. My knack for innovation and a few key patents meant that my company decided to buy me out rather than continue to afford my salary and benefits. This arrangement worked out well for both of us. They got to use my patents and save on my salary, while I walked away with enough money to not worry about working ever again. Initially, my wife was thrilled. We downsized our living situation and began to travel, enjoying the freedom and resources we hadn't had before. But after a while, the novelty wore off, and the reality of constant companionship began to reveal aspects of each other that years of marriage had somehow kept hidden. While love remained, likability fluctuated, a testament to the challenge of spending too much time together. Consider the math, a day is 24 hours long, with work and sleep claiming the majority of it. When you remove those elements and factor in the time spent together, it's a significant adjustment leading to inevitable discoveries about each other's habits and quirks. It dawned on me that aside from vacations, Linda and I barely shared a few hours together daily. Suddenly, I was faced with the reality of being with her every hour of every day, indefinitely. It became clear we shared little in common beyond our daughter. Linda seemed perpetually confused or simply didn't grasp things easily. I didn't choose Linda for her intellectual prowess. My reasons were more primal and superficial. She was passionate, stunning, and had a charm about her. As an engineer, I weighed my options carefully, figuring that even if age dulled some of her qualities, she'd still be a joy to be around. However, I miscalculated. Over time, intimacy became a bargaining chip for her. Initially, it was her way to sway decisions. When I learned to resist, she reversed the tactic. After a decade, the struggle wasn't worth it, and our intimate moments dwindled to when it mutually suited us. Regarding her allure, I missed the mark as well. Linda was breathtaking at the start, the epitome of physical beauty. It's true, many maintain their allure through effort genetics, or other qualities that go beyond appearance. Regrettably, Linda didn't fall into any of those categories. Over the years, she neglected herself, altering the appearance I once adored. When we met, Linda's physique was something to behold. Today, the numbers remain the same, but their significance has shifted, reflecting a change in her physical state that she refuses to acknowledge. Our differences extend beyond the physical. I'm far from perfect, often too meticulous, and admittedly, my personal interests have sometimes overshadowed our relationship. Yet, I've remained faithful and kept myself in shape through regular exercise. Linda, blessed with natural beauty, never felt the need to maintain it. This contrasted sharply during our travels. I sought out hotel gyms for maintenance, while she preferred a more leisurely approach to vacation, viewing my routine as an unnecessary constraint. On the flip side, I found it frustrating that our options were so limited because of Linda's struggle to walk even a short distance and her frequent need to stop for meals. Whenever I suggested a new activity, she'd respond with, We can't do that. It requires too much effort. Or she'd dismiss it with, we can't do that. That's meant for children. The most disheartening realization about my partner, whom I had once considered my soulmate, was witnessing how her outlook had shifted as much as her physical condition. Over time, she had become someone who claimed to know it all while acting contrary to her own words. She preached about equality, insisting that a woman could achieve anything a man could. She also believed that since we were both retired, though she hadn't really held a job, the responsibility of household tasks should be evenly distributed. I'm not one to hold on to outdated beliefs, I fully supported sharing chores. I'd wake up early, complete my exercise routine while Linda was still asleep, and then start on the household chores, making sure to do only my half, leaving the rest for her. However, Linda would find ways to avoid her portion of the work, claiming certain tasks weren't suitable for women. One such task was taking out the trash. Despite the widespread belief among many that they are capable of doing anything, this simple chore seemed an insurmountable task for her. She insisted that it was a job no woman should have to do, as if there was some unwritten rule against it. In the end, it was something as mundane as taking out the trash that spelled the end of our marriage. It seems trivial that this could be a breaking point for two people who once shared love, but that's exactly what happened. One Saturday morning, Linda walked in and demanded I take out the trash she had just finished filling up, just as I was settling in to watch a track meet on TV. As a keen runner, I was captivated by the athletes who excelled in a sport I loved, a concept lost on Linda.
who lacked any interest in physical activity. Stan, I need you to take out the garbage, right now, she demanded. It wasn't just her request, but the way she said it, disregarding what I was doing and showing a lack of respect. No, I responded. Her reply was sharp, indicating a willingness to use affection as leverage. This moment encapsulated the growing rift between us, highlighting how far apart we had grown not just in our abilities and interests, but in our respect and understanding for each other. It's been a while since we've been close, I remarked. I'll manage. Her reaction was intense, and she stormed off. With just us two at home, we didn't make much mess, so the trash bag was barely full. Suddenly, she passed me with a glare, hauling the bag away. She returned in no time, still shooting daggers with her eyes. That's how the rift began. An icy tension hung between us for a week, then out of the blue, she warmed up again. The reason was beyond me, it seemed utterly unprovoked. It felt like the disagreement had evaporated, although I hadn't been upset to begin with. Perhaps she concluded the whole thing was trivial and decided to move past it. After reconciling, guilt crept up on me, but things were going smoothly, so I hesitated to stir the pot. Interestingly, she became possessive over the chore of taking out the trash, snatching it from me whenever I attempted. I get it, I commented. You're holding on to some resentment. Not at all, she replied, pecking my forehead. I'm not upset with you. Well, I've figured it out, I continued. You're avoiding certain intimacies under the guise of chores. We can be intimate whenever you wish, she said, adding a condition about needing a shower that evening. I was puzzled. It wasn't like her to drop a matter so easily. Driven by guilt and with Valentine's Day approaching, I decided to go all out and purchase the diamond bracelet she had been eyeing, even opting for a higher carat. The expense was significant, nearly $3,000, but I felt it was worth it. I also planned an elaborate evening at our favorite restaurant, complete with flowers and all the trimmings, aiming for an unforgettable Valentine's Day. I didn't procrastinate, either. With more than a week to spare before Valentine's, I was quite pleased with myself, breaking my pattern of last-minute, minimal effort gifts. I was actually proud, thinking this time, I wouldn't have to defend the lack of thoughtfulness by arguing that she should know my love by now after so many years. Reflecting on our situation, I noticed her appearance hadn't changed, but her attitude had softened significantly. The love was always there, but now there was a newfound appreciation for her willingness to let some disagreements slide, giving me fresh reasons to hold her in high regard. An odd observation was the increase in trash output from our home, necessitating more frequent disposal than before. Even stranger was the length of time she spent outside supposedly tossing the trash, far longer than a simple walk to the dumpsters warranted. On the eve of Valentine's Day, I took it upon myself to handle the chore of taking out the trash, hoping to do her a small favor. Yet, this simple act somehow sparked a heated debate about capabilities and gender roles, leading to a long-winded lecture about how women are just as capable as men. Deciding it was best to avoid further conflict, I retreated to the living room and turned on the TV, while she, somewhat indignantly, took the garbage bags and left our apartment. Curiosity got the better of me, and I found myself peering through the slightly ajar door, watching her until she disappeared around the corner. Feeling a sudden urge to follow, I sneaked down a different staircase and made my way to the back of the building, hoping I hadn't missed her. The nightly jogs had paid off, allowing me to get there ahead of her. Out back, I spotted our building manager, Dino, fussing over his old BMW, a car he treated like a rare gem despite its evident wear and tear. My own car, a 2010 Mustang GT, was in far better shape though Linda seemed to share Dino's misplaced admiration for his vehicle. Ignoring Dino, I focused on the task at hand, wondering what could possibly be so intriguing about taking out the trash. To my astonishment, Linda bypassed the dumpster entirely and approached Dino. What unfolded next was a scene straight out of a clandestine rendezvous, with Linda engaging in an intimate moment with Dino that seemed completely out of place in the grimy alley. It was a sight that left me frozen, a tableau of betrayal that seemed to stretch on endlessly. The details of their encounter are etched in my memory with painful clarity. There was a sense of disbelief at the sheer audacity of it all, the way they seemed to lose themselves in the moment, oblivious to the world around them. Dino's gruff exclamations mingled with Linda's encouragements, creating a discordant symphony that echoed off the walls of the alley. Eventually, the moment passed as abruptly as it had begun, with Dino casually resuming his previous task as if nothing out of the ordinary had occurred. I lingered just long enough to ensure Linda had returned inside before making my own way back, my mind reeling from the shock of what I'd witnessed. The vividness of the memory still haunts me, a stark reminder of the unexpected revelations that can disrupt the calm of our everyday lives. Linda walked into the apartment just moments after I'd resettled in my spot in front of the TV. She seemed perfectly normal as she passed by, nothing about her demeanor suggested she was overly happy or on edge. Had I not witnessed what I had just moments before, I wouldn't have guessed anything was amiss. It's funny, there's some truth to the saying that women can be more discreet than men. In fact, Linda's skill in disguising her feelings nearly caught me off guard. She handed me a cold dos equis from the fridge and cast a curious glance my way. What's wrong, Stan? 
She inquired, noticing something amiss despite my attempt to focus solely on the TV. Nothing, I replied, my voice strained with effort to sound unaffected. Then why do you look upset? Have you been crying? She probed further. I quickly fabricated an excuse. Oh, that. I was just frustrated because our team lost in the relay again. Got a bit too animated and accidentally poked myself in the eye. I'm convinced the other team has an unfair advantage, but there's no proof yet. She studied me closely, sensing something wasn't right. Changing the subject, I mentioned, I think I'll take the Mustang for a spin. At night, she questioned. Why not? I countered. She hesitated, then suggested, I was thinking of taking a relaxing bath, but maybe later we could. You know, she hinted with a hopeful smile, alluding to rekindling our intimacy. Sorry, I cut her off, I'm not really in the mood. The truth was, her advances only reminded me of the guilt she must be feeling. The thought of being close to her again felt impossible. I grabbed my old leather jacket and made for the door, leaving her speechless. As I reached for the door, she called out, hoping to accompany me. Why? I questioned. You've never been fond of my car. With that, I closed the door behind me, both in a literal and figurative sense, shutting off the outside world from our home and simultaneously closing off my heart from Linda, determined to shield it from further pain. As I headed towards the garage, my path crossed with Dahlia Martin, a strikingly beautiful neighbor with an effortless charm. She greeted me with a subdued wave, unlike her usual cheerful self. Curious, I approached her to find out what was bothering her. My car just won't cooperate today, she said with a frown. Dahlia usually worked from her condo, handling some kind of online business, so stepping out must have been critical. Why don't you call your friend to pick you up? You're absolutely worth the effort, I suggested. You're the kindest, Mr. Laurel, she replied, her mood lightening quickly, but it's a work thing. I need to head downtown for a meeting about some updates and to handle my annual paperwork for taxes and insurance. Then I'll drive you, I offered. I was planning to take a drive to clear my mind anyway. If you can't find a ride back, just give me a call, and I'll come get you. But that seems like a lot of effort for you, she protested. Well, when you're retired like me, any reason to get out and about is welcome, I joked. I really appreciate this, she said. I'd be in quite a bind without your help. It's no bother at all, I assured her. As we made our way to my car, she linked her arm with mine. Starting the car, the engine rumbled to life, and soon we were smoothly exiting the parking lot. The drive downtown was quick, only about 10 minutes on the freeway. I entered the destination into my GPS as per her instructions. Done, I announced. Why did you do that? She inquired. Just in case you need me to come back for you. This way, I can find you no matter where I am, I explained. I'm sure I'll manage a ride back and won't need to bother you, Mr. Laurel, she said. Indulge an old man's whims, Dahlia. Let me have your phone, I requested. With a smile, she handed it over and I saved my number in it, giving her a quick call to link our phones. Handing it back, I made sure she knew she could count on me. If you need me, you'll be able to reach out, I offered, ensuring she knew I was there for her. With a nod, she stepped out of the car and I was back on the road, making my way to the freeway. Driving was my escape, a way to clear my head. I prefer the open freeway to the cluttered streets, avoiding stops and enjoying the speed. It was just me, my car, and my music, an uninterrupted trio. The cool February night in Arizona was perfect, allowing me to drive with the windows down, the night air mixing with the blaring tunes from my stereo, breaking the quiet around us. It was a simple pleasure. There I was, a man in his fifty seconds, cruising in a car that echoed the designs of four decades past, mourning the end of a marriage that had spanned over thirty years, all while listening to anthems from two decades ago at full volume. That night, my soundtrack was Sonic Temple by The Cult. The track American Horse became my anthem, channeling my frustration and fortifying my resolve against the waves of betrayal. Discovering the person you've shared over three decades of love, laughter, and arguments with has turned away from you isn't easy. But, I reminded myself, it wasn't insurmountable. Part of me still cared for her, despite our differences and the distance that had grown between us over the years. Perhaps this was her way of seeking something she felt was missing in us. I tried to understand what she found in him that she believed was lacking in me. It wasn't about physical appearance or financial stability, I was confident in what I offered. It might have been his tolerance for her unpredictable moods, a patience I struggled to match. Yet, their connection seemed shallow, devoid of the warmth and intimacy I believed love required. Maybe there was love on her part, or his, but their interactions seemed too cold, too mechanical for that. Their secrecy only confirmed my suspicion, turning ordinary moments into hidden rendezvous. It was a painful realization, one that hit me as the chorus of American Horse filled the car. In my mind, I changed the lyrics to fit my situation, singing along to a personalized version that echoed my disbelief and heartache. She's lost it, completely lost it, trying to tame the American horse. It was a moment of clarity, mixed with a touch of irony, as I tried to make sense of the chaos that had unfolded in what I thought was a stable life. The woman I often sang about in my quieter moments was Linda, my wife of many years. She'd lose her mind if she thought I'd tolerate her recent behavior any longer. 
and if she believed that a sudden change in attitude, after weeks of coldness over something as trivial as forgetting the trash, would hold any sway over me, she was gravely mistaken. Like the untamed spirit in the song, I refused to be subdued or manipulated. The song had initially drawn me in because I likened the American horse to my passion for Mustang cars. Yet, ironically, it had come to mirror my sentiments about our failing marriage. A marriage, I realized, that was beyond saving. I had no intention of spending my life with someone who neither cherished nor respected me. The time had come for change, for both her and Dino. With these thoughts, I took an exit and veered onto the freeway in the opposite direction, heading home with renewed determination and a resolve as firm as steel, just as Firewoman blared through my stereo. I pressed the accelerator, my smile widening with each idea of the steps I'd take in the coming days. Each thought brought a sense of satisfaction until a sudden jolt interrupted my reverie. I thought it was a health scare, but it turned out to be my phone vibrating. The music had drowned out the ringtone. Hello, I answered. Mr. Laurel, came Dahlia's voice, filled with distress. I'm sorry to disturb you, but I really need that lift, she managed to say. I'll be there shortly, just wait for me where I dropped you off, I assured her, turning my car around to head her way, my earlier thoughts of vengeance temporarily forgotten. As I drove to Dahlia's aid, my mind shifted from my own troubles to concern for her. Dahlia, always so upbeat, now sounded utterly defeated. I hurried to her, curious and worried about what had upset her so. Upon reaching her, she rushed into the car, looking like she was fleeing from a terrible ordeal. Home, I inquired softly. Yes, please, she replied, her voice barely a whisper. We drove mostly in silence, each lost in our own thoughts until, a few miles from home, she reached out to hold my hand. I welcomed the gesture, offering silent support. Pulling into the garage, she finally seemed to relax. Thank you so much, she expressed her gratitude. Dahlia, it was the least I could do, I responded, watching her walk away, transformed from the vibrant woman I'd known to someone carrying the weight of the world on her shoulders. Dahlia, she paused and turned to look at me. If you ever need someone to talk to, I'm here, I offered. She nodded silently before continuing on her way to her place. I contemplated leaving again but realized what I needed most was rest. Tomorrow wouldn't be the day I had planned with Linda, but it promised to be eventful in a different way. Upon entering my own space, I found Linda absorbed in a TV show. Her smile greeted me, but I simply headed to bed, puzzled by her cheerfulness. It dawned on me later, her smile wasn't warm, it was mocking. She seemed amused, probably thinking I was oblivious to the truth. Her recent kindness now made sense, it was all a facade, her way of making a fool of me. She had tried to manipulate me with her usual tactics, but this time I stood my ground, showing her that those games had lost their effect on me. She looked for other ways to assert her control, resorting to secrecy. Her outward niceness masked her real intentions, believing I'd cave to her demands. But what she reserved for me, she freely gave to another as a twisted form of reprisal. It was a cruel joke, but I was determined not to be the one left humiliated in the end. That night, as Linda attempted to get closer to me in bed, seeking contact, I feigned deep sleep. Poor Stanley, she whispered, believing I was oblivious. You're missing out. I love you, Stanley. But her notion of love, tainted by betrayal, was something I could no longer value. I preferred the honesty of those who showed me disdain. They at least treated me with a semblance of respect. The following morning, I got ready for my run, choosing warmer gear for the cool air. Linda stirred as I was about to leave. You're up early, she remarked. Indeed, I replied, my tone light yet tinged with sarcasm. She seemed puzzled by my distance. I've loved you for so long. Shall I make breakfast? She offered, a gesture that now felt empty in the wake of everything. Nope, I'm heading out for a run, I declared. Why not use your treadmill? She inquired. It's a beautiful day outside, I responded. Stanley, we're in Arizona. Apart from the peak summer heat, every day is beautiful. Isn't there something you'd like to express or do? Yes, I replied. Catch you later. As I moved towards the door, her expression turned to one of surprise. Suddenly, things began clicking into place. Perhaps Linda found humor in the situation because she assumed I was oblivious to her disloyalty. And then it hit me, Linda must have known about the bracelet I purchased for her. It dawned on me that one of her chatty friends worked at the jewelry store, so Linda likely knew about the bracelet before I even brought it home. She might also be aware of the dinner plans since I had discussed them with the jewelry store owner. Well, she wasn't going to get anything from me. No wonder she had been overly eager lately. Now everything fell into perspective. As I ran, my thoughts lingered not just on Linda, but on the whole concept of Valentine's Day. It seemed like an expectation for men to splurge on gifts like candy, flowers, and jewelry for what felt like a repetitive gesture. Wasn't there a more genuine way to express love? It made me question if the day was more about proving love or appeasing insecurities. I mused over the idea of creating Valentine's cards for those whose love had faded. That could be a lucrative venture. Running in the park, I saw many people enjoying the day, walking, skating, biking, and running like me. Observing them was entertaining, sparking curious thoughts about their lives. There were attractive people around, yet the age difference made me hesitant. The thought of starting over after Linda was daunting. 
In my fifties, I wasn't old, but reconsidering marriage after so much time invested in Linda seemed overwhelming. Completing a leisurely five-mile run in the cool morning breeze and sunshine was refreshing. People watching added a layer of enjoyment to the experience. I resolved to run outdoors more often, whether in health permitting. Staying with someone unfaithful wasn't worth my time. As I made my way back to our shared space, my mind was a whirlwind of tasks I had to tackle. Top of the list was meeting with my lawyer to discuss the divorce proceedings. Then, there were the financial matters that needed sorting. And finally, the search for a new place to live was imperative. I was torn between selling our current home or simply leaving it behind for Linda. Upon re-entering our home, the aroma of Linda's cooking filled the air, her efforts making it seem more like a festive holiday than just another February 14. Ready for dinner, love. She greeted me, her tone cheerful. She had dressed up in a delicate robe, beneath which peeked out an elegantly designed piece of lingerie that accentuated her figure. Her attempt at dressing up was noticeable, complete with makeup and styled hair. I need to freshen up and then head out, I replied, dodging the immediate atmosphere. Jimmy McDonald is retiring, and I've planned a lunch for him with a few colleagues. But Stanley, you do remember what day it is. She probed, a hint of hope in her voice. Sure, it's Wednesday, I dismissed, feigning forgetfulness. It's Valentine's Day, Stanley, she said with a smile, hoping to jog my memory. Right, happy Valentine's Day, I said, though my mind was elsewhere. I actually forgot, to be honest. Our expression shifted between confusion and amusement. Do you think I should dress up for later? Were you planning something special? She asked, hopeful for a shared outing. No plans, I replied curtly, but you're welcome to go out if you like. I meant together, Stanley. Maybe dinner or a show. She suggested, still optimistic. That could be an idea, I conceded, but perhaps this weekend. Everything's probably booked solid tonight because of the holiday. With that, I retreated to the bathroom, leaving her standing there, taken aback. After my shower, I got dressed and prepared to leave. My lawyer, Ollie, was a good friend and would likely accommodate me without a prior appointment. Linda's voice drifted from the other room as she spoke on the phone. Arlene, he's up to something, pretending as if nothing's special today. I just wish I could let on that I know about his surprise plans. He seems to find joy in these little games. But, it's these moments that add a bit of excitement to our long history together. So, I'll play along. Oh, I have to go, he's just finished his shower. I lingered for a short while before grabbing my keys with a deliberate clatter and swung open the bedroom door. In under twenty minutes, I was stepping into Oliver's office. His secretary, a notably charming brunette, glanced up as I entered. I'm not aware of any meetings for Mr. Hardy this morning, she informed me. I'll let him know you're here. She rose and vanished into Oliver's office, leaving me alone with my thoughts on how the vibrancy of youth seems so often misplaced. She soon invited me into Oliver's office, inquiring if I'd like something to drink. I declined with a smile, content for the moment. Oliver was there, amusing himself with a golf pudding trainer in his spacious office. You're wasting your time, I blurted out. Your drive struggles to make 80 yards on its best day. It's not your pudding that needs work, you need to beef up those arms. Cut it out, Stanley, he shot back with a grin. Just because you're out of work doesn't give you the right to come here and nag someone who is actually doing their job. My apologies, I retorted with a thick layer of sarcasm. I was under the mistaken impression I had walked into the office of Oliver Hardy, professional golfer, not my scheming attorney. And what does this scheming attorney need to do for you today? He asked, maintaining a mock serious tone, not once tearing his gaze from his miniature golf game. He lined up for a shot and swung just as I dropped the bombshell. I need you to handle my divorce, I declared, right as he took his swing. The sudden news made him hit the ball with excessive force, sending it careening across the room. It hit the ramp of his pudding green, flew off, and smashed into the LCD monitor on his desk, leaving it cracked. What? He gasped. Oliver had been my best man, practically a fixture in my home, and was even my daughter's godfather and the executor of my will. Stanley, you've got to be kidding, he protested, the color draining from his face. You owe me a new monitor. You nearly gave me a heart attack. I'm serious, Ollie, I replied firmly. But why, Stan? He pressed, his voice heavy with concern. Every marriage has its trials. You just need to weather the storm. It'll get better. Anything's better than calling it quits. Oh, I exclaimed, I never imagined the scene of her and the maintenance guy from our condo complex in the alley next to the trash bins would be the least of my worries. So, what could possibly top that? Man, you need to distance yourself from her immediately. I had no idea. Think about the health risks, and I'm not just talking about the usual suspects. The area around trash bins can be a breeding ground for all sorts of harmful bacteria. Seriously, steer clear of any intimacy. So, Ali, what's our first step? I inquired. We're already on it, he replied. You've got me on board. I'll begin drafting the documents. We'll propose a settlement that's fair to both parties. Then, we'll serve her the papers, she'll find a lawyer, and we'll try to negotiate something. Most of these cases don't end up in court. What do you mean by fair to both of us? I questioned. I've heard nightmares about divorce settlements. Stan, you two have been together for what, 30 years? He pointed out. 
Chances are, you'll have to divide everything down the middle, regardless of the circumstances. His words made me stare at him in disbelief. No way, I retorted. I thought you were the type to bend the rules. Anyone could give me that advice. Remember, you're representing me, not both of us. We need a strategy that leaves her with far less. Stanley, he said, giving me a look. Fine, I conceded, she can take a quarter, but that's it. Stanley, that's not legally sound, he cautioned. Even in the most severe situation, a judge would likely award her at least 40% of the assets. A quarter means just 25%. Not a chance, I protested. You're mistaken. I meant 25 cents, not 25% of everything I've earned while she did nothing. I'd rather walk away than give her that much. There's no way I'm compensating her for betraying me. He looked at me as if seeing me for the first time. Let's search for some loopholes, I suggested. Is it legal for me to sell the condo? Is her name on the deed? He inquired. Not at all, I confirmed. Then, theoretically, yes, it could be done. But if we ended up in court over this, things could get really complicated. Do any laws require married couples to cohabit? I inquired. No, he replied. It's generally expected that you'd want to live with your spouse, but there's no law mandating cohabitation. What about laws mandating divorce? I probed further. There are none, he responded. However, if you vanished, she could initiate a divorce and you'd still end up dividing your assets with her. So, what if our only major asset was the condo and I transferred it to her? I questioned. He paused, pondering, before responding. That was the focus of our discussion until we broke for lunch. My aim was to figure out a way to move on from Linda with minimal financial loss. It might have been harsh of me to plan this for someone I had shared over 30 years with, leaving her without much to her name, but I'm only human. I hummed my new anthem all the way to my car, if moving on is wrong, I don't want to be right. Our conversation wasn't just about Linda, Ollie and I also strategized about dealing with Dino. Trouble was brewing for him too, but timing was crucial. If I dealt with Dino before Linda, she'd suspect something. I needed to rearrange our finances first before confronting Linda, and only then could I address the situation with Dino. On my drive home, I transferred half the funds from our joint savings and investment accounts into new ones solely in my name. I also visited the plant to remove Linda from my insurance policies and retiree benefits. In our state, she would automatically inherit these unless explicitly removed in my will. The clerk in the accounting office bombarded me with questions about my actions. I explained that Linda had started a successful business, claiming she no longer needed the benefits. There's never too much money, he commented with a grin that irked me. He then handed me a form requiring Linda's signature to officially remove her from my retiree account. I was astonished. After dedicating 27 years to that place, it seemed absurd that Linda's signature was needed for changes to my account, considering her infrequent visits. I managed a polite smile, took the form, and left. I had it all figured out, the plan to make her sign the paperwork. There was also a document from Ali that needed her signature, which would make Linda a co-owner of the condo. I'd moved past the thought of kicking her out. The plan was to leave on my own terms. Since I wasn't leaving any financial support behind, she'd eventually lose the condo and her credit would be in shambles because she couldn't afford the payments. Our place was valued at over $100,000. My strategy was to refinance the condo, withdraw all the equity, then leave, letting Linda fend for herself. Additionally, I was plotting to make some dubious business decisions that would deplete most of our liquid assets and investments. I planned to not touch my retirement fund until I was 65, which gave me about 13 years. By then, I hoped Linda wouldn't be around, just in case the courts decided she was entitled to a share. Driving back to the condo, I felt a strange sense of cheer, despite the turmoil of the last 24 hours. I knew deep down I was still processing everything, and soon, the full weight of my situation would hit me. I wasn't sure how I'd cope then. Upon parking my car, I noticed Dino eyeing me with that familiar smirk of his. Now, I understood its meaning. Nice car, Mr. Laurel, he commented. I brushed him off and continued on. But before reaching my door, I decided on a different course and headed to Dahlia's place instead. After a brief wait, Dahlia cracked the door open, mistaking me for someone else at first. She eventually welcomed me in, saying a friendly face was always a pleasure. Inside her apartment, as she excused herself to get dressed, I decided to do something kind for her. Pulling out my phone, I called the florist. The florist recognized me, not just because of the size of my usual orders, but because I was a regular customer for Linda's flowers. I inquired about Linda's latest order, which hadn't been sent out yet. I requested a change of delivery to a different address in our complex, promising the driver a handsome tip for speedy service. Since the bouquet was simply labeled for the lady of the house, there was no need for any alterations. A short while later, Dahlia re-entered the living room. She appeared somewhat eased, yet not entirely back to normal. What's bothering you? I inquired. Where do I even begin? She replied. Apologies for earlier. I mistook you for Dino, that nuisance. He's perpetually loitering in my hallway, knocking on my door daily under the pretext of needing to inspect various things. 
Yet, he never discovers anything, and when I question other residents, they report no such inspections in their units. I suspect he has ulterior motives. Noticing her glance at me when mentioning Dino, my facial expression must have betrayed my thoughts. You're not fond of him, are you? She prodded. I can't stand the guy, I admitted, with more venom than intended. I'm truly sorry, she expressed. So, you're aware, then. I accidentally came across them when I was disposing of trash a few weeks back. They were so engrossed that they didn't even see me. I ended up leaving my trash outside. He's reprehensible. And to think Mrs. Laurel would. Indeed, there are many unexpected things happening, I remarked. You seem quite composed, she noted. Only superficially, I confessed. Internally, I'm in turmoil. I'm merely trying to stay active to prevent it from overwhelming me until everything is resolved. When did you find out? She inquired. Just yesterday, I responded, somberly. Everything feels altered since then. It's as if I'm seeing the world anew. If you don't mind me asking, she ventured cautiously, what's your plan? I've decided on divorce, I declared. Please keep it to yourself, as I wanted to catch them off guard, but the process is already underway. But have you considered why she did it? Perhaps she had no choice. Have you thought about your future? When my grandfather passed, it was as though my grandmother's life paused with him. It took her over five years to find her footing again. Despite her age, my grandmother is radiant but couldn't fathom life without him. What will you do? She questioned. Nope, I declared firmly. There was no coercion involved. It was she who initiated everything. That was the situation I observed yesterday. And I'm perfectly fine on my own. I'm still young, capable of starting anew if I seek companionship. However, I believe I'd be better off by myself than with someone who doesn't genuinely want to be with me or someone who deceives me. I'm certain she has feelings for you, she reassured me. Perhaps, like many nowadays, she's just seeking a bit of excitement elsewhere. A friend of mine was about to marry a medical student. He's a year away from finishing school and landing a promising position at a hospital. They've been an item for four years, yet she barely sees him. So, during those especially lonely nights, she, well, sought comfort elsewhere. Somehow, the word got out, and he ended their engagement. She became overly persistent in trying to justify her actions to him, to the point he had to legally keep her at bay. Now, he's seeing someone from the hospital's administrative staff. We've heard they might tie the knot soon, and my friend is still struggling to move on. She's still in love and concocting futile plans to win him back. It seems like these days love and intimacy don't always go hand in hand, she observed. They do for me, I countered. And for me as well, sadly, she added. That's a positive, I reassured her. You'll find it leads to greater happiness in the end. I'm quite confident of that, she agreed. I've got another year and a half of school. And as of last evening, I'm facing financial uncertainties. Once my savings deplete, well, I'll be in a difficult spot without any support. What happened last night? I inquired with concern. Mr. Laurel, I was completing some paperwork for the new management at my job last night. One of the executives took an interest in me upon first glance. He propositioned me in a manner I couldn't accept. He was simply repulsive. An older man in his forties, not taking care of himself, adorned with too many ostentatious accessories. When I declined, he hinted at the potential loss of my job. I stood my ground and refused. So that's what's been troubling you, I noted. What do you do for work? She averted her gaze to the floor. I'd rather not say, she responded. It's a topic I prefer to avoid, but I assure you, it's respectable and lawful employment. Checking the time, I realized we were nearing a deadline. I'm feeling hungry, I mentioned, shifting the conversation. Mr. Laurel, maybe I could whip us up something, she offered. I'm not exactly a chef, but I managed to cook a few dishes. Actually, Dahlia, I was thinking we might go out for lunch. It might be nice to share our woes and perhaps brainstorm some ways to navigate our shared troubles. I'd like that, she responded. Cooking isn't really my forte. I've tried, but somehow, the knack for it just passed me by. Her confession made me chuckle. Linda wasn't a master in the kitchen at first either, I shared. She had her. Let's call them experimental moments, but I adored her too much to mind. Reflecting on those early days with Linda brought a pang of nostalgia, mixed with sorrow. Until that moment, I'd only focused on the person Linda had turned into, not the woman I had once deeply loved. I'm sorry, Dahlia said gently. Did I bring up something painful? No, Dahlia, I reassured her. I was just lost in memories of Linda as she used to be. We decided on a quaint Italian bistro a short walk from our complex. Our meal was filled with light-hearted chatter, easing the gloom that had been settling over me. It turns out there's some truth to the idea that shared misery can lighten the load. Being together made us feel a bit better. Around three in the afternoon, I drove us back. As we approached the parking area, a young teenager zipped by and dashed toward Dahlia's front door, leaving a bouquet of flowers. Dahlia's face lit up with a smile. Let's see, she mused. These definitely aren't from my grandma. Wonder who they could be from. She glanced at me with a playful smile. The delivery boy returned. Need a signature for these, he said, buzzing with energy. Dahlia signed his clipboard and returned it. He hinted at a tip, saying he'd heard rumors of a generous one. What's the biggest tip you've ever received? I played along. 
a thousand dollars, the kid boasted. Now, that's quite the tale, I said with a laugh, and Dahlia joined in. All right, the most I've gotten is twenty dollars, he corrected himself. I was planning to give you fifty bucks, I started. But the deal was you needed to get these flowers here two hours ago. A nice tip was waiting if you managed to deliver them within an hour after I hung up with your boss. Shoot, he muttered. That's why she put your order at the back. They were meant to be delivered first. And that's exactly why the tip slipped through your fingers, I pointed out. He looked as forlorn as a lost pup. However, think of it this way. You've gained something much more valuable than cash. You've earned experience. You've seen firsthand how not to do things. Now, you'll know to approach tasks more wisely and organized. Experience is an invaluable mentor. Great, thanks, he responded with a downcast tone. I'll just head to the electronics store and see how many video games I can grab with experience. Or maybe I'll treat my girlfriend to a night out on this experience. Enjoy your Valentine's Day. Dahlia was trying to hide her amusement, pouting playfully at me. Fine, I conceded, but you're not getting the 50. I handed him $20, and both his and Dahlia's spirits lifted. Surprisingly, I felt a bit of warmth in my heart too. Dahlia's kiss on my cheek and her gratitude for making her Valentine's Day special left me with a smile. When I walked back into my place at 3.15, Linda was waiting, visibly upset. Where have you been? She demanded. Linda, I already told you my plans, I replied calmly. There are some documents here that need your signature. Why do I need to sign anything? She questioned. Because, Linda, nobody lives forever, I explained gently. Even with all my running and workouts, accidents happen. When I got this place, it was just in my name. I'm updating my will and realized you're not listed for the condo. If anything were to happen to me, you might find yourself in a tough spot, unable to stay here or sell it if you needed the funds. Her demeanor softened. You're actually worried about what could happen to me if... She paused. Sweetheart, I know we have our moments, but sometimes you really surprise me. You do care, deeply, don't you? The depth of my care for you, Linda, I said, is beyond what you might imagine. My statement carried an undertone of humor only I could catch. I slid the stack of documents across the desk, and Linda, predictably, signed each one without a second glance, even the one I'd sneakily included amongst the condo paperwork. By doing so, Linda had inadvertently agreed to cover the loan payments I'd secured against our shared equity in the condo and had also relinquished any claim to my retirement funds. Her focus was elsewhere, though. Barely pausing, she fired off another question. Stanley, do you recall our conversation from this morning? She inquired. Ah, uh, give me a moment, I replied, needing an escape. I need to step into the office. Once there, I fired up Microsoft Publisher and quickly crafted a Valentine's Day card, deliberately misspelling her name for that extra touch of irritation. Returning to the living room with an exaggerated grin, I presented her with the card. Happy Valentine's Day, dear, I announced cheerfully. Her reaction was priceless, a perfect blend of disbelief and annoyance as if she'd tasted something utterly displeasing. Who's Limdy? She demanded. That's exactly the issue, I countered. Moments ago, you were convinced of my affection, and now, a simple typo has you up in arms. It's precisely why I disdain Valentine's Day and similar commercialized celebrations. It's an endless losing battle for guys. With that, I retreated to our bedroom, loudly shutting the door behind me. Settling into bed, I struggled to contain my amusement. Shortly after, Linda peeked in and, thinking I was asleep, withdrew to the living room. I overheard her on the phone, lamenting the lack of effort on my part, mocking the hastily made card, and speculating on non-existent dinner plans. She surmised I might be trying to provoke her, deciding then that she'd meet my challenge. Moments later, Linda joined me in bed, attempting to cozy up with a series of kisses. I couldn't hide my discomfort. I'm just exhausted, I mumbled, turning away. Her concern was evident as she sat up. Stanley, are you alright? She asked, a hint of worry in her voice. She looked at me with genuine concern, as if she really cared. Perhaps she was just trying to figure things out. Something's not right, she observed. You've declined intimacy twice now. Linda, ever since our disagreements began about a month ago and you mentioned it would be a while before we were intimate again, I've shifted my focus, I explained. There are goals I want to achieve in life, and I need to start working on them. I might have pushed myself too hard during my run this morning, so I'm quite exhausted. Her eyes widened in surprise as she looked at me. Stanley, is there something you're not telling me? She inquired. Have you seen a doctor recently? What's on your list? Maybe I can help with some of them. How much time do we have? That's when it dawned on me. She mistakenly thought I was gravely ill and had made a bucket list. Throughout the evening, she popped back in a few times. Stanley, you don't want to go out for dinner or anything, right? She asked at one point. Just tired, I replied. Stanley, honey, do you remember today's date? She probed. It's Valentine's Day, and it's almost over. Thank goodness, I responded. Now, things can go back to normal. Stanley, are we celebrating Valentine's Day at all? She asked, clearly frustrated. I did give you a card, didn't I? I pointed out. She stormed out, slamming the door so hard the entire building vibrated. 
She returned to bed around midnight, donning a nightgown so heavy it looked like armor. She kept as much distance between us as the bed would allow, attempting to hog all the blankets. Her anger was palpable. I barely contained my laughter. I woke up early the next morning, ready for another run. As I was in the kitchen grabbing a quick snack, Linda stormed in. My comment, we will see if OP fixes his life or not in the final part 2 ending coming tomorrow. It's a bit of a long one. Subscribe and you will see the ending ASAP.